in the next video we are looking at the African regional human rights system, the system for promotion and protection of human rights in Africa. In doing so, I will briefly look at the main treaty that uh, is uh, the anchor of this system, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. I look at four features that one could say are uniquely African. Uh, the first is the concept of peoples. The second, justiciability of socio-economic rights. The fourth is uh, the justiciability of the right to development. And the last is um, the concept of individual rather than state duties. After having done that, I'll briefly talk about some challenges and suggest some emphases for uh, resolving those challenges into the future. The African system for protection and promotion of human rights is really the third of the well-established human rights systems following after the European system that came about in the 1950s and the inter-American system that really took off in the 1960s and 70s. The African system's basic normative frame is anchored in the African Charter on human and people's rights and that African Charter has been adopted in 1981 and entered into force in 1986. So in a sense if one looks at the African system of human rights protection the question that one may pose is what is unique, what is specific uh, to the African as opposed to the inter-American and the European systems? I try to answer that question, but I also caution that we don't try to look for something quintessentially African as opposed to anything else in when we discuss the African system's unique features. For me, it's like the African system embodies universal principles and features, principles and um, uh, values that just happen to have been focused upon and been emphasized within the context that Africa presented. I think each of the regional systems really is a response to a particular context that demands a certain framework to be established. So for me the African Charter uh, has four very specific features that really are responses to the context in which the Charter was founded and established. The first is really already in the title, African Charter on Human and People's Rights. In that respect the African Charter is quite different because it encompasses not only the rights of the individual, but also the rights of collectives, peoples. And I think that speaks to the African concern for uh, a communal kind of view of the world, communitarianist uh, perspective, as opposed to a very atomistic individual concern for well-being. So the concept of peoples then really also begs in a sense definition what does it mean what does this collective encompass if you like on the one hand the african commission on human and people's rights which has been established to interpret and supervise the charter that commission gave us clarity in a case against zaire as it then was the drc today the commission clarified that um, the katangis a group that wanted to secede from the territory of the mainland that they constituted people on ethnic linguistic uh, grounds. But later on, in a case concerning Cameroon and the Southern Cameroonians, an Anglophone group that asserted also their right to be uh, treated more fairly, and also among them people wanted to secede from the state of Cameroon, the Commission there looked differently and said, but it's not necessarily ethnically based, this concept of people. It could be merely a collection of people that, that foment and, and, and kind of see themselves grouped together on the basis of loyalty and cause and uh, ideology, if you like. So that's the first and important feature. But the implication of this feature is that standing before African human rights institutions is also very different. One does not have to be a victim as an individual, but you can bring a case on the basis of a collective uh, the basis of the public interest that has been affected. So this idea of the people as a collective translates in the African system to a much broader standing requirement that I think is very appropriate in a continent where standing and access has been quite problematic in terms of issues of approaching the Commission and the Court. The second issue that I think one could see as unique to the African Charter is uh, justiciability of socio-economic rights. In other words, socio-economic rights uh, being the basis for legal claims before uh, justiciability 
enhancing organs like courts. Let us think back to the 1980s when the Charter was drafted and adopted. At that time, we had the two main UN covenants, the one on civil and political rights and the one on economic, social, cultural rights. And the distinction, you would recall, is that civil and political rights were seen to be immediately justiciable, that you could bring claims on the base of these rights. But, on the other hand, socioeconomic rights were seen to be programmatic and only to be realized if available resources were actually um, uh, uh, put to, 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 to that um, uh, specific means and ends. What the African Charter does is it, it obliterates essentially this distinction, this dichotomy, because in the Charter you find that civil and political rights so-called and socioeconomic rights so-called are seamlessly included in one document and treated for all purposes as, as equal, if you like. So you would, meet, you would move in the African Charter from the right to equality, to association, freedom of association, to health and to education. The justiciability, the reason uh, for being and the uh, possibility of approaching the Commission and eventually the Court, there is no distinction in the African system in respect of the, the, the nature of, of the right. And that really speaks again to the reality of the African continent, because it was because of the deprivation, the level of deprivation that these socioeconomic rights were almost inconceivably to be separated from civil and political rights in terms of their justiciability. So the African Charter in this respect again responds to the kind of materiality of being that um, led to the adoption of the Charter. The third element um, of the Charter that I'd focus on as a distinct feature is um, Again, justiciability, but the justiciability of the right to development. Now, that's related to what I just talked about. But in the UN system, there's been great contestation. Is the right to development really a right as such? In the UN system, there was only the possibility of agreeing on a UN declaration on the right to development so far. Contrast the African system, where the right to development has been included in the Charter as a right equal to all other rights. In other words, a justiciable right. Even then, commentators said, but what does that really mean? Fortunately, subsequently, the African Commission came in one of its decisions, the decision of the Enderoys community against Kenya. The Enderoys is an indigenous community. They lived since ancestral times in one area of the country, beautiful area, Lake Bogoria. But they were evicted to make room for a, a nature reserve. Um, and in the process, they were not consulted and their livelihood was detrimentally affected by this uh, forced displacement. The claim by this community against Kenya led to Kenya being held accountable, accountable for having infringed the right to development. And this case shows that the right to development has both a substantive element, that your livelihood, your being, your totality of being is affected by government action, but it's also procedural, the way in which government does so. Uh, the uh, lack of consultation or consent by the community. And it is the confluence of those two elements that really showed what added advantage the right to development brings to the human rights discourse. And that again is a contribution that the African system brings um, in a very particular way. The last element uh, of the African Charter, very briefly, is the um, notion of individual duties. Usually, as we all know, the duty bearers uh, are states because they ratify the treaties. But in the African Charter, there is a number of provisions where we also see that individuals are uh, given duties. What does that really mean? In a sense, we cannot um, say that individuals would be held accountable if they don't perform their duties, but the individual duty concept brings morality and the idea of the individual being embedded in the community more broadly, it brings that to the fore. So it again harks back to the notion of the kind of African cultural identity and tries to find a place and underscore that we are not individuals, we are not kind of um, atomistic, but we are connected and rights and duties are reciprocal uh, and that is really also an African way of looking at things. Now, having said all that, you would uh, kind of have the sense that the African system is great on normative 
uh, expansion. And that is true. Normatively, the African system has made great strides and contributions. Apart from these I mentioned, we also have the Maputo Protocol that speaks in very specific ways to the rights of women in ways that the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women does not. And we have an African Charter dealing with the rights of the child that again does the same thing. But, you know, if we take a step um, aside, we have to concede that uh, in the practical application, in the implementation of these rights, clearly there are much to be desired. The domestication of the norms by states is incomplete and when the African Commission or the African Court actually gives decisions, there has been a practice of uh, non-implementation. It's not unique, by the way, to Africa, but we have seen uh, frustration by the human rights organs for this lack of implementation, not only the Commission, but also the court. We have seen some cases of the court uh, decisions being implemented, the one against Burkina Faso, uh, for example, but those are relatively sparse and few and far between. Um, so I suppose when we look at that, we see that the issue around the African system is, uh, in a sense, the resistance, the incomplete embrace of states of their actual obligations. We've also seen recent years, in recent years, the um, political bodies, the Executive Council, which are the Minister of Foreign Affairs, insisting that a decision which the African Commission take be reversed. And that decision concerned uh, the granting of observer status to an NGO. The NGO was called the Coalition of African Lesbians. So the Executive Council took the position that granting observer status to such an organization was against African values. And the Commission was ultimately forced or the Commission succumbed to reversing its decision. Now clearly, I think that is in a sense illustrating the increasing power and influence of the Commission, that the states are really taking the Commission's work seriously and pushing back. But it also opens up a moment of potential uh, undermining of the system itself, because uh, where we are, and the moment now, is towards the end of 2019, the Commission is now rightfully accused or crit criticized for having sacrificed its own independence and autonomy by accepting the political view and, and, and then reversing a decision that it had taken. So we are in precarious uh, territory at, at the moment. I think the solution, if we look to the future, is to make sure that all the organs within the African Union support one another and that human rights are more clearly mainstreamed into the organization. We see that the African Union is undergoing uh, processes of reform. President Kagame has been spearheading that process. But that reform mentions human rights only sparsely. And I think the key is that the different organs within the African Union need to take human rights on board. You think about the Pan-African Parliament. There is an organization where parliamentarians around the African continent come together. But human rights is not yet seen to be central or at least a core element of, of that um, that organ of the African Union. I think um, you know the uh, years ahead will depend very much about how we find the uh, different organs working together because human rights, as we know, will always be uh, a thorn in the flesh of states. But as long as civil society at the domestic level uh, fight the fight, bring the issues to the attention of states, I think we will be in safe hands. So ultimately, as far as the African human rights system itself is concerned, much depends on the, um, the actual people elected to hold office in the African Commission, the Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Court. And to get the right people, I think, really requires civil society to, from the ground upwards, work towards identifying the right persons, bringing the issues to the attention of governments and putting pressure on governments to uh, nominate and elect the right persons. Because if you, if you end up with the wrong individuals actually um, being in uh, the positions of supervising human rights, then I think we will find that states have a, a greater erosive effect uh, on human rights. So I think for me, uh, in a sense, uh, the uh, African system is poised in a very delicate place, but there's a normative backbone that can certainly secure that these uh, temporary weaknesses can be overcome on the long run, one hopes.